Hi. Hi, everyone. I'm Christina Harris, Director of Land Use and Planning at the Metropolitan Planning Council. On behalf of MPC, the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, and the City of Chicago, I'd like to welcome you to the second of a seven-part event series on We Will Chicago, the first citywide plan in more than 50 years. Each event in the series will feature a panel presentation of international and local city experts, along with participant polling to provide feedback and input on the plan's draft policies. The events will occur each month from June to November. Be sure to register for upcoming events at wewillchicago.com. The next event is scheduled for July 28th and will focus on environment, energy, and climate pillar. Today's event features a speaker from London, England, part of the United Kingdom. London has a population of approximately 9 million and is a very cosmopolitan city with estimates of approximately 37% of the population born outside the United Kingdom and 25% born outside of Europe. We're eager to hear more about London today and about the other international cities during the rest of this virtual series. Now I'd like to introduce Claire Rice, who is the Executive Director of Arts Alliance Illinois, a statewide service and advocacy organization that champions art supportive policies and funding opportunities to benefit all Illinois residents. Under her leadership, the Alliance recently received a nonprofit innovation award for their work managing the $7 million for Illinois Relief Fund a public-private partnership between the state of Illinois, city of Chicago, private philanthropy, and grassroots donors supporting the arts community in response to COVID-19. Previously, she was the national director of Sustain Arts at Harvard University, a project that equipped communities with meaningful data on arts and cultural activity. Claire will be today's moderator for the panel. I will now turn it over to Claire to get us started. Thank you so much, Christina. And thanks to all of you who are joining us online today. Um, as Christina said, today's panel presentation will focus um, and the workshop will focus on the arts and cultural pillar for We Will Chicago, um, which represents an opportunity, a really unique opportunity to create an inclusive vision for the city through a planning process, encouraging neighborhood growth and vibrancy while in addressing longstanding social and economic challenges. So at the end of this month, the city will release the draft framework plan. It will include policies and objectives focused around eight pillars, which represent the topic areas. As we all know, we're discussing the arts and culture pillar today, and we know arts, culture, and creativity build stronger, more vibrant, vibrant communities, plays a critical role in contributing to economic development. Um, so making significant investments in this area will advance Chicago as a city where creative residences and uh, residents and businesses thrive. Uh, so this event today will dive into the goals proposed for arts and culture as part of the We Will Chicago plan. It will provide an opportunity for new ideas and dialogue with some exciting global work happening in London, and then encourage all of you to provide input on some key recommendations for the plan via a polling tool called Menti, which is the end of the program today. So that we can all engage easily in the discussion, just a few housekeeping points. We've enabled the Q&A function on Zoom. You can find it in the bottom portion of your screen. We ask that you use the Q&A function to post any questions so we can easily access them. Um, you know, we'll try and find them in the chat as well, but it'd be better if you could put them in the Q&A. Um, the event also features live closed captioning in English. Uh, so please click co closed captions here in Zoom to turn the English captions on and off. We'd also like everyone to know this event is being recorded and we will share a link to the recording and any relevant resources in a follow-up email so you can keep an eye out for that. As I mentioned, this event features a workshop after the panel with an opportunity for you to provide direct feedback on the goals and objectives for the arts, or arts and culture pillar of We Will Chicago. So please do try and stay till the end of today's session if you can. It'll be um, 90 minutes in total, 60 for the panel and, and 30 for the uh, workshop afterward. We have a tight agenda. So if we don't get to your questions within the Q&A, we will send out answers to all of the questions that we receive as a part of the event follow-up. So I think that's it for the housekeeping side. Let's jump into meeting our esteemed presenters. Uh, Amanda Carlson, a senior strategist for the Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events, um, who's working on cultural policy for the city of Chicago in collaboration with the city's cultural sector. Before recently returning to Chicago from Los Angeles, she has gone deep in multi-year participatory planning initiatives with the LA Public Library, the city of West Hollywood and others as well as driving strategy for the artist-led social enterprise, Public Matters, which everyone should check out their work. Um, wanna thank you for being here, Amanda. 
Uh, Aaron Harkey is the commissioner of the Chicago Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events, appointed to the post by Lori Light, Mayor Lori Lightfoot in November 2021. She has 20 years of experience in planning, cultural policy, nonprofit arts and government work. She's held many roles at DCASE, as well as a dual appointment as senior policy advisor for arts and culture in the mayor's office. And prior to coming to Chicago, she also um, come, hails from California and previously uh, managed public arts programs at the Los Angeles County Arts Commission, Arts Council for Long Beach. So, you know, people have to cut their teeth in LA before coming to, uh, <laughs> to Chicago. We, we make sure of that, right? And then finally, really happy to have our colleague um, from London, Laya Gash is the Senior Advisor for Cultural and Creative Industries for the Deputy Mayor of London. She is also the Director of Partnerships for the World Cities Culture Forum, which is a leadership network of 40 global cities working to advance culture and the creative economy. She comes to this work after an illustrious career as a cultural producer, developing projects for the 2012 Olympics, large scale collaborations across cultural institutions on the South Bank, as well as work for the BBC and National Theatre and others. So I'm so pleased she can join us. Um, so we'll start today. Amanda will provide um, an overview of the We Will Chicago plan with an emphasis on the goals and objectives for arts and culture. Then Commissioner Harkey and Laya will provide brief presentations of their arts and culture initiatives. And then we'll all have a, I know, robust discussion um, that I'll moderate. So I'm gonna turn it over to Amanda to get us started. Thanks, Claire. Um, it was exciting to spend the last eight and a half years in Los Angeles, but my accent will betray me and uh, my roots as a Chicago and will certainly come through. Um, so it's a pleasure uh, to be with everybody today. Um, my name is Amanda Carlson. And as Claire mentioned, I'm a senior strategist with DCASE. And I'm looking forward to providing some grounding um, in the work of We Will Chicago to date, provide a look at where things will go from here, um, and really an overview of the content that was developed by many people who, develop, who uh, dedicated time and energy in crafting the goals and objectives for the arts and culture pillar. Um, so we'll dive into um, We Will uh, with the next slide. So We Will Chicago is the first citywide plan uh, since 1966, and it is intended to chart a better future for all Chicagoans in every neighborhood. While the city has led planning efforts specific to certain neighborhoods and efforts to develop plans by sector in the past, it has not had an overarching vision and roadmap for how to achieve those goals since that 1966 plan. Um, and in charting out a course uh, to develop this multi-year planning process for We Will Chicago, Chicago wanted to approach this in a way that was different from other cities um, that have kept these processes only within and among their staff. Um, from the beginning, it was important that Chicagoans, um, all of us, guide a people-first process. Um, the goal was and remains to sustain widespread and deep participation from residents um, over the arc of pre-planning, planning, and implementation. And that process began back in 2020 um, when We Will stakeholders started from a place of acknowledging uh, municipal planning's exclusionary and racist history. Um, and that was as true in Chicago as it was in other places. And it took as a deliberate starting point um, that acknowledgement of harm as a place to begin the long-term work of addressing the history. And so it was through simultaneous investments in trust building and engagement um, that the plan is working to position us all to grow and succeed in the coming decade. Next slide. So in the context of these early public engagement conversations around planning's history, it became clear that the dual principles of equity and resiliency needed to anchor the overarching planning effort. The city of Chicago defines equity as both an outcome and a process that results in fair and just access to opportunity and resources that provide everyone the ability to thrive. Resiliency is the ability of an individual or a group to thrive despite stresses, obstacles, and setbacks. Um, these principles were core to the pre-planning and planning process. Um, but alongside these principles, five themes emerged. Historical reckoning and trust building, evaluation of equity impacts, community engagement, accountability, and interagency and cross-collaboration. Those five themes and the, the two principles run as through lines and currents in the whole We Will Chicago process. Next slide. 
So holding the principles and themes in mind, We Will Chicago presents a vision for how Chicagoans should work, play, and live through the structure of eight pillars. And these pillars are really quality of life metrics um, that are intended to capture the breadth of um, the way Chicago works. Um, Those pillars are housing and neighborhoods, economic development, transportation and infrastructure, environment, climate, and energy, arts and culture, which we're talking about today, public health and safety, lifelong learning, and civic and community engagement. When the planning process started, there were only seven pillars, um, as you'll see the note on the slide in front of you. Uh, But based on the considerable input of residents, um, Chicagoans and community partners, really about how the city should work, Um, and how uh, Chicagoans wanted to be agents of change within their own communities, it became clear that civic and community engagement needed to be both embedded within each of these pillars, but also to stand on its own. Um, And the creation of this eighth pillar of civic and community engagement is really one of the best examples of the responsive nature of the planning process, um, but also the interconnectedness of the goals and objectives um, across these quality of life metrics. Next slide. So what is this city plan going to do? What will, how, what will it accomplish? Um, what does a community defined vision and goal for the city's future look like? Um, it'll be implemented in a number of ways, but it will start by beginning to inform our annual budgets, major projects and policies. Um, it'll ensure more equitable development. It'll help establish standards for neighborhood plans and create standards for public decision-making. It'll inform how we include communities in development planning and land use and zoning decisions. Slide, please. So this uh, slide in front of you shows an arc of the planning from 2020 to the present Um, and at where we're at today is at this momentous end of phase two and the upcoming release of the draft framework plan and this next phase of public engagement. Uh, But as I mentioned earlier, this has been a people first process from the start and public engagement began began back in 2020 um, when the principles, themes and pillars were developed. Um, In phase two um, in 2021, uh, the group Honeypot Performance was brought on to lead a cohort of artist organizer teams to develop participatory tools and pathways for residents uh, to contribute. We're gonna, and so we're gonna skip, we're gonna take a look at this timeline here, but we're gonna skip and um, dive a little bit deeper into the artist engagement um, as this is the arts and culture pillar conversation, but also to say that in thinking about what a people first plan looked like, um, that meant connecting with people in new and creative ways and uh, the artist organizers during 2021, uh, hosted 80 virtual and in-person events, connecting with over a thousand people. And these artists um, connected by pillar topic area, but also as a mobile artist team. And they served as a connection link between community members and across the city to the research pillar teams that uh, dove deep on creating the goals, objectives, and policies um, that we'll look at today. So we can skip back to the timeline. Because artists have been fundamental to this process, Um, again, acting as links to the research teams made up of volunteers and community groups who work together to craft the policy based on public input. Uh, Simultaneously, there were community engagement events and also uh, website surveys where Chicagoans could share their thoughts and vision. But as I said, we're now at this inflection point um, in the, at the end of June, 2022, about to embark on um, phase three, where we're expanding public outreach efforts to get public feedback and comments on the draft plan, um, hosting more community engagement events, and also continuing uh, our relationship to artists in this work to commission new projects. And the next, and then we can skip to the next slide to dive a little bit deeper 
into the timeline of what happens now um, between June and January 2023. So with the release of the draft plan, we're embarking on this phase of, of broad public engagement. People will provide feedback on the draft and that will be incorporated into a, a new version that will be finalized and go to the Chicago Plan Commission um, in early 2023. And concurrently, the Department of Planning and Development and its partners across city government are preparing for implementation. Next slide, please. So in the coming weeks, everyone on this call and all Chicagoans will be able to review the public document, which will take you through the goals and objectives of each pillar, along with data and information that provides context and nuance. Uh, so you'll see that in the slide in front of you, on the left, there's the, the um, goals and objectives, on the right, data to accompany that. And then on the right-hand side of your screen is a preview of one of the ways that the city will be collecting feedback on the draft. And the city has actually already begun to collect survey data at events that are taking place in June. Next slide, please. So June marked the start of uh, the summer of engagement. So if the heat hasn't gotten you into the summer spirit and uh, maybe you're you know, looking for what's gonna make you really feel uh, this time of year, talking city visioning and planning might do it. So bring your favorite neighbor, uh, grab the person at the nearest festival um, and stop by the We Will Chicago tables uh, and pop-ups to provide your feedback on the draft plan. Um, the, this coming weekend, the We Will team will be out at the Taste of Chicago in Little Village and at the Tropiteca Pride event at Ping Tom Park. All of the events are listed on uh, We Will Chicago's website if you go to the calendar link listed on the screen. There you'll be able to participate in conversations and take the survey. Um, but in addition to these pop-up events, uh, there will be deeper conversations happening among people and groups whose voices and perspectives have not yet had a chance to shape the draft framework. And so those focus groups will be uh, coming, coming soon. And the list of ways to provide feedback is evolving and intended to be responsive. So if you know of a community event or opportunity where we will can pop up or be a uh, participant, please email uh, the address that's there listed on the screen, we will at cityofchicago.org. Um, Truly, uh, this is an iterative process and we want to hear from you about what you know about happening in your communities. Next slide, please. So the reason we're all here today um, to dive into the goals and objectives of the arts and culture pillar. Um, I'll quickly go through a recap of these um, so that we can then embark on the panel discussion um, and workshop. And the, the text that we're gonna go through now really is a representation of the dedication of the research team members, artists, and partners who spent time over the last year creating uh, the policy recommendations you see in front of you. Hundreds of people were involved in the research teams, and they really were um, dedicated to ensuring that these captured uh, the breadth of the sector. And so in service of the sector, the goal one is about supporting the resiliency of the creative sector, its workers, organizations, and businesses for a healthy and vibrant city. This looks like strengthening the infrastructure and systems of support needed for creative sector organizations, businesses, and individuals to thrive. It looks like decreasing barriers that have prevented access to city funding for creatives and arts and culture organizations, prioritizing racial, gender, disability, geographic, and other equity considerations, ensuring that employment policies for creative workers used by public and private entities are fair and equitable, and supporting the relationships necessary for creatives to develop skills, pursue opportunities, access jobs, and connect within the field. Next slide, please. Goal two is really about engaging artists, our creative businesses, and cultural organizations to advance the quality of life in all Chicago communities. This looks like using the power of arts and culture to build vibrant, healthy communities, increasing the number of creative businesses and cultural spaces in community areas that lack them, 
and prioritizing private and public investment in historically under-resourced community areas. Next slide, please. Goal three is about ensuring all Chicagoans have access to robust, relevant, and joyful arts education and creative workforce opportunities at every stage of their lives. The objectives are to advance access to pre-K to 12 arts education within Chicago public schools and other school-based providers, advance access to lifelong arts education opportunities within each Chicago community area, and strengthening the infrastructure needed to support pathways to careers in arts education as part of broad workforce development efforts. Next slide, please. And finally, the fourth goal is to promote awareness and appreciation for the value of the city's cultural sector, its current and historical contributions to residents and those beyond the city's borders. The objectives for this goal look at expanding the focus of the city's marketing efforts to highlight the cultural assets and programming of all community areas and supporting and responding to local marketing and advocacy efforts by communities and arts and culture groups. So that's a high level overview of the goals and objectives. Certainly, I uh, will have more time in the workshop to dive in further. And you'll also have a lot of time to consider the goals and objectives and provide feedback during the summer of engagement and into the fall. So once the draft plan is published in the coming weeks, the further, uh, further detailed policy recommendations will appear on the We Will Chicago website. And there you'll be able to see all of this content as well as the connections and intersections between pillars. Just as elements of the arts and culture pillar touch on housing and neighborhoods, economic development and lifelong learning, other pillars include language that links back to arts and culture. So there's a ton of richness to explore and to provide your feedback on. Next slide, please. So thank you for your time today. Um, I hope you enjoy the conversation on cultural policy that is forthcoming and the workshop and that you dive into exploring the draft framework when it's released in the coming weeks. Thanks so much. Thanks so, thanks so much, Amanda. I'm gonna turn it over to um, Commissioner Harkey to share uh, some of the great work that's happening in Chicago uh, related to We Will. Uh, thanks, Claire, and uh, thanks, Amanda, for that um, overview. Um, this is a really exciting um, opportunity for us at DCASE, and I think a really op exciting opportunity for uh, the arts in Chicago. Um, one of the things that we, you know, really started off to do with this kind of We Will Chicago planning process, which is why we brought um, artists on board really early on, is to really start to think about um, arts and culture, not just as a standalone discipline, but a discipline that has, uh, you know, tentacles and application across um, all of these different areas that we're talking about, be it economic development and housing, to environmental justice work, to civic engagement, all of the pillars that um, uh, were mentioned, right? Um, there is a, a room for arts and culture to play in kind of all of those spaces. And so uh, what we're attempting to do is to really uh, develop a comprehensive um, plan for arts and culture, one that recognizes just the interconnectedness of the work that we do. Um, and that comes in large part for, from, uh, you know, collaboration among uh, city, city agencies and, and departments. Uh, and we really have um, done a lot in, in the past uh, couple of years to really build those relationships, whether it be with the Department of Planning, uh, through exercises like this, to CDOT, to the Mayor's Office with People with Disabilities, uh, through libraries, through parks. Uh, you'll see in some of the exa example programs that I'm mentioning that a lot of this work is really um, about um, uh, interagency uh, co collaboration. Um, so next slide. Uh, the first thing that I wanted to talk about, which I think is, you know, the, the most important thing uh, that the Department of Cultural Affairs uh, does, and that is our grants programs, so the money and resources that we make available uh, to the cultural community. 
2022, I, uh, and thanks in large uh, part to you know the advocacy uh, that was uh, done by uh, Arts Alliance and other uh, folks in the field, and uh, thanks not in any small part to the uh, commitment of uh, the mayor, uh, Lori Lightfoot, to uh, support arts and culture. A uh, DKS did see an, a kind of historic increase in its budget of $26 million, which includes uh, $10 million of dedicated revenue stream from the city's corporate budget, plus $16 million in ARP funding. And all of this is going to uh, supplement uh, our cultural grants budget and also to uh, help um, make our kind of cultural resources and support programs uh, more robust. Uh, you know, one of the uh, kind of main objectives um, that's articulated in the uh, We Will Chicago uh, plan uh, for arts and culture is to really decrease barriers uh, that have prevented access to city funding uh, for creatives and arts and culture organizations, prioritizing racial, gender, disability, geographic, and other um, equity considerations. Um, you can see, um, you know, how that disparity kind of plays out uh, across uh, the map with the, the map that's on the slide. Um, you know, certainly there uh, the most concentration of uh, applicants and, and grants um, are going uh, to the kind of downtown uh, core, um, but the department has uh, made a lot of progress uh, in terms of uh, increasing that geographic distribution. So in 2022, we're now uh, servicing all 50 wards uh, in the city of Chicago. We've also made a substantial progress uh, in our individual artist program. Um, we're now seeing that 60% uh, of our individual artist program grantees are black, indigenous, and people of color. Uh, and that is compared to, you know, 38% in just 2016. So we are uh, seeing a lot more um, kind of uh, ethnic representation within our grant program, which is great. Um, we're also seeing more geographic uh, distribution citywide, and that's thanks uh, in large part to programs that we've launched, like the Neighborhood Access Program. Uh, the Neighborhood Access Program is unique because um, uh, we recognize, right, and traditionally there has been a kind of eligibility criteria that says you know, cultural grants can only go to um, organizations whose, you know, primary mission is to present arts and culture. Um, we know that that is a significant barrier and doesn't really reflect um, how arts and culture kind of shows up in our communities. Not every community is going to have uh, what we call formal cultural infrastructure, so a museum or a theater, right? Um, cultural activities um, might be happening in more, you know, community or, you know, social uh, service uh, based um, uh, environments. So in our churches, in our parks, in our community centers. Uh, so we uh, launched the neighborhood access program to, um, to uh, really expand the reach of our grant program by making a community and social service organizations and even uh, you know, churches that have uh, missions outside of their religious ones, right, have cultural missions uh, eligible to apply. And this also uh, applies to, you know, chambers of commerce and SSAs. Um, so we're seeing really pro positive progress also with that uh, particular program where, you know, 90 93% of uh, grantees to that program are um, from the south and west sides. And we're also seeing that 70% of those grantees are also from uh, priority neighborhoods that are uh, through the Invest Southwest program um, or um, otherwise low to moderate income. Next slide. Um, one of the uh, uh, new grant programs that we've launched that has um, some of this kind of equity stuff built in uh, is a, a program that is at now active. Um, it's a collaboration uh, with the Office of Racial Equity and Justice and uh, DCASE, and it's part of the uh, kind of Together We Heal initiative. So these are uh, substantial grants. Uh, we're anticipating that we will give out about 50 of those um, from uh, 200, uh, ranging from uh, $25,000 to $500,000 for more um, sort of substantial programs. Um, these are uh, programs that are um, really using art and creativity and community engagement um, at the intersection of um, overall community health um, and vitality. Um, the application is open to, uh, 
until July 20th at 5 p.m. Uh, really encourage all of you who are um, you know, deeply embedded in community and do, uh, doing community work to um, take a look at this opportunity. Next slide. Um, one of the other things um, that we are doing um, really around the kind of uh, planning and uh, community development space um, is uh, about uh, building uh, infrastructure, public art infrastructure. So in addition to the 26 million that we received uh, uh, through the 2022 budget uh, to help support our cultural grants program, uh, we also received um, $6 million through uh, the city's capital program uh, to integrate public art uh, throughout the city. Um, and with the uh, uh, promise of some uh, additional dollars also coming to support this program. So uh, right now we are uh, focusing um, those public art investments in collaboration again with the Invest Southwest initiative, which is the mayor's signature initiative to uh, spur economic and community development on the southwest, south and west sides of the city. Um, it's a really important initiative that's looking at uh, stacking, right? A public investment across uh, many different agencies because if we can move those resources together and really be in deep coordination, then we can um, move move farther uh, together. Um, so we're engaging again uh, artists to work with us to engage residents to uh, help us determine how um, those uh, millions millions of dollars now coming for public art investments um, will actually be spent and allocated. So uh, really important to us that. Uh, the decisions about how to spend this money um, is coming from uh, direct uh, conversations with community. Next slide. Um, another important, I think, uh, collaboration um, that we've expanded upon, um, and there's already always been, I, I think, a deep collaboration, but we've extended uh, really our partnership uh, with parks and also with libraries, thinking about how um, this public infrastructure is so important uh, to access conversations, especially uh, in, in communities, again, that are lacking what we uh, might classify as traditional infrastructure, but our parks and our cultural centers and our parks and our libraries um, are great places and always have been great places for um, people and community to experience and access culture. Um, so we were really happy to uh, launch the first uh, artist and residency, pro residency program at Legler Regional Library in uh, West Gulf Brook Park uh, with Alexandra Antoine. Uh, she's also from the local community. She has a very rich uh, creative practice that includes um, food and uh, community building and arts education. Um, and so when we did uh, the redevelopment of the regional library, uh, we also uh, developed a, uh, a residency studio for an artist. So uh, Alexandra maintains uh, regular hours, uh, uh, bi-weekly, open studio hours at the, at the library, um, and also working with the community to develop some um, additional programs um, that they'll be able to access. Uh, Lager Library, um, again, is in West Gulfport Park, but it is such an underexpressed uh, cultural, asset, uh, 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 cultural asset. Uh, it also has a, um, a mural by uh, you know, famed uh, Chicago artist, um, uh, and also numerous public artworks, right, uh, that are uh, in that space. Um, the mural is, of course, by Carrie James Marshall, um, other, other artworks by Elizabeth Catlett. Um, and so it's just, we want to make sure that um, those assets are visible to people and having uh, Alexandra in residence there helps us to, um, you know, make that culture that's inside come out and engage with the community. Next question, uh, next slide, excuse me. One of the um, also, I think, important things and important focuses of um, some of the recommendations that are coming out of the We Will Chicago plan and that we're you know, continuing to uh, develop at DCASE is this uh, real emphasis on um, the creative worker and how to make sure that Chicago is a place where uh, creative workers can live and work and thrive. And certainly, you know, part of that, um, there's a lot of things to that, but part of that and a really important part of that is this kind of professional development and commitment to um, ongoing learning for uh, creatives. Um, our signature professional development program um, is the Chicago Made program. Um, it includes, you know, free workshops, panels, and other showcasing opportunities for uh, young people and adults. Um, 
we're able to, you know, connect people through these programs to a variety of funding resources, including our festivals and our special events. Um, and uh, there's real emphasis on kind of high growth areas for us. So TV, film, uh, music, and other creative industries through the professional development programs. Uh, we've expanded the professional development program to um, kind of work in deep uh, partnership um, with other um, cultural organizations and presenting partners that are in this professional development space. So we're now giving out uh, grants to organizations to build professional development programs that uh, folks in the creative community can access for free. Next slide. Um, and just a little bit more expanded about uh, the Chicago Made um, professional development program. It is also um, our brand for communicating, right? Uh, the impact of arts and culture on Chicago. Um, one of the uh, kind of final recommendations uh, in the We Will Plan is about this kind of um, increased visibility, right? And advocacy for uh, the creative industries here in Chicago. So um, as you may know, film again is one of the kind of higher um, growth interest industries for us in, in Chicago. We just announced our film numbers and across the state, we're looking at a $630 million of um, economic impact in, in 2021, just from the film industry. And Chicago sees uh, the kind of majority of that activity. Um, so in addition to um, uh, kind of meeting the moment, right? Um, we also need to make sure that our workforce is uh, prepared. Um, so we did create a new uh, film uh, initiative where we're creating workforce opportunities, primarily focused on uh, residents from 24 uh, to 50. We're looking at targeting underserved areas to help make sure that uh, Chicago residents and Chicago creatives are connected right to uh, these opportunities in the film, TV and film in industry. And then kind of a secondary part of that is also just making sure that um, people know, right, um, that creative careers are careers. And so we were able to um, really take advantage of some of the uh, uh, Chicago collateral uh, infrastructure. Um, and so we did these kind of great uh, train wraps just to uh, let people know, right, that uh, creative workers are part of a part of the Chicago community and um, that creative jobs, right, help also uh, fuel and support uh, Chicago more uh, broadly. So I think that's it. Um, but um, I'm really excited to participate in this conversation. The fact that there, you know, has not been a citywide plan since uh, 19, I think, 68. Um, it's just long overdue. And I appreciate um, our colleagues across city government that are uh, letting us uh, and alongside with us in terms of uh, really taking a fresh approach in terms of how the arts get integrated and articulated uh, in this plan. And I think it's a really exciting moment for us. So thanks. Thank you, Commissioner. I'm gonna, um, we're gonna turn to our colleague, Laya, in just a second, but we wanna ask you, uh, there's so many questions that come out of all that content. Um, and we will get to more dialogue uh, with the group and, and answering um, audience questions as well. But one particular question to you, given, given your kind of planning nerd background, um, if you, you know, this, the goals in this plan really revolve around engaging artists, creative industries, arts organizations, improving the quality of life in Chicagoans. But we, of course, continually in arts and culture face challenges in our own sustainability. So if you can just reflect on your own planning experience and background and, and think about just kind of in the, in the bigger picture, how citywide plans help support creative sectors or how you've seen planning processes really bring, um, shed light on the importance and the value of arts and culture um, in kind of a bigger tent sense, that would be great. And then we'll, we'll turn to London. Well, I think what's, what excites me, I guess, about this particular planning process, I certainly, you know, we certainly have seen um, to uh, great effect here in Chicago, right? Uh, the cultural planning process that happened in, in 2012 um, you know, but a lot of times the kind of arts and culture, you know, kind of cultural planning process kind of stands alone, right? And I think what is exciting about this particular venture is that arts and culture, right, is a pillar adjacent to all of these other city priorities. Um, and so when we, you know, talk about advocacy and we talk about sustainability, the sustainability of our sector is really in getting in these conversations um, that aren't just arts and culture specific, right? You and I talk about this a lot, Claire, about, um, you know, creative workers are workers, right? 
Um, and so there are things about our creative workforce that are unique, but there are also things that are not unique, right? Um, and there are things that are analogous to other gig workers and other sectors, right? And so if we can get in these conversations in terms of sustainability and we can look for those connection points across, right, across government, across sector, um, where the arts and culture um, community can benefit, right? Um, I think one, you know, evidence of that is that there's a lot of, um, you know, resources coming from ARP investments and, and lots of city governments, right? So uh, agencies, not just DKs. But a lot of those opportunities for business development resources through DPD, arts and culture organizations and businesses are also eligible for those particular programs, right? Um, and so we need to make sure that as policy is being developed in um, and planning and development and housing and environmental work, that as policy is developed in those sectors, that they're also developing policy um, with consideration for the arts and culture sector. And policy development for the arts and culture sector is just not the responsibility of DK, it's the responsibility of every agency to consider, right, the needs of creative businesses and organizations and creative workers. Um, and so I think this is why this is exciting to me. And I think having that, um, uh, you know, kind of internet interconnected strategy means that we can build a much more sustainable ecosystem for um, creative workers principally, right? Because organizations are made up of individuals. So if we can focus on kind of how to take care of individuals, um, then, um, you know, we'll have a lot more pathways to make sure that uh, our businesses and our organizations and our individuals are, are thriving and successful. Thank you. Really helpful. Um, and we'll get, we'll dig in more in just a minute, but I want to turn to um, to Laya and the incredible work happening in um, London, which I know will um, be in dialogue with everything we just talked about in Chicago. So over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Claire. And uh, just listening to Commissioner Erin Harkey, I get goosebumps. I'm so inspired. It's like expanded program, increased budget, working across departments and across urban policy um, uh, agendas. It's so good. It's so inspiring. It's so encouraging to see that. That's that's what you know. A lot of the cities, a lot of what we want to do is is happening. It's happening. Um, uh, as Claire said, thank, well, first, thank you for inviting me. And as Claire said, I'm, I'm policy, I'm an advisor to uh, create creative industries and culture for the Mayor of London, and also work with this project called the World Cities Culture Forum. Next slide. Um, the World Cities Culture Forum is a global network of 40 creative cities and civic leaders. It's people like uh, Commissioner Erin Harkey uh, all around the world, uh, around, around five continents. We share our best ideas and we design cultural policies that benefit all aspects of life. I often call it an IP-free zone. Basically, we nick each other's ideas. You know, when we see a good idea happening in a city, we go, that's brilliant, um, I'll take it and I'll adapt it to my city. We believe in the power of culture to transform lives and places. We're generous with our ideas and we collaborate to drive change. So today I wanted to share some of the examples of new policies that we, are, uh, create, we have created in London uh, in order to support and grow culture in the city. Next slide, please. Why do we support culture in our city? I mean, I don't need to tell you, I'm preaching to the converted here, but I just wanted to share a couple of uh, statistics with you. Uh, culture and the creative industries contributes 58 billion uh, pounds. That's about $71 billion to the city's economy. And it, con it uh, constitutes one in six jobs. That's one in six jobs in the city. But there are some challenges. It's a fragile infrastructure. Most of our sector is small organizations or micro organizations, and often governments struggle to find ways to support more small organizations. Erin's touched on, on this already. Uh, plus often culture doesn't always take place in the glitzy theaters and museums. Next slide, please. 
It also takes place in the grid of the city, on rooftops, on warehouses, on basements. Erin mentioned libraries, parks, you know, people access culture in all different parts of the city. So it's important that we've got this sort of broad understanding. The first thing I wanted to say is that there is no one silver bullet. Uh, there's not one single policy that will fix and allow culture to drive. We know what we want, right? We want to support our talent. We want to keep our spaces affordable. We want to retain and grow our cultural assets. So we need more like a suite of policies. Often we call it like acupuncture. We need to do acupuncture policies in the city. So I want to share with you some of our acupuncture policies that we've done in the city. Before I do this, I just wanted to address a question that was on the, on, on the invite. What do London and Chicago have in common? And of course, the answer is arts and culture. We're both global creative cities and creativity is deeply rooted in our city. Often we say in London, culture is our DNA. Uh, and I've got to confess here, you will have guessed by my, by my accent, I'm not British. I am originally from Barcelona, so another creative city. But we, all cities have similar challenges and similar issues around growing and supporting culture when it comes to a policy context. Next slide, please. Culture is usually at the bottom of the list. It's great to see uh, that in Chicago, you've got you know, your seven pillars. And as Erin was saying, it's at the same level as the others. That is brilliant to see. That is not the norm. Usually it's seen as a nice to have, not as a must. And it's an area that is usually cut, their budgets are cut when cities have to tighten their bells. So how amazing that Chicago is making, uh, doubling its commitment uh, to culture is really good to see. And this is what we want to see. Uh, that's the part of the change we want to see in World Cities Culture Forum, because we believe that culture can deliver against all urban policies. Next slide. We know that culture contributes to economic development and creates jobs. By the way, they are the jobs of the future, because we know that 87% of creative jobs are at low risk of automation. Uh, we know that uh, culture builds stronger and more vibrant communities. We know that culture makes us happier and healthier. But how do we infiltrate departments? It's a bit what Erin was saying, you know, how do we work with other departments, not, not in isolation? Uh, and it is the, the, the beauty of it is that we need, we want to infiltrate. We want to infiltrate these other uh, agendas and other policies, often with a lot bigger budgets than, than culture have, because we know that culture can deliver against their own, uh, their own objectives. Um, and the fact that London now has a deputy mayor for culture and creative industries, it means that the city has recognized the value of the work in the, within the structure of the mayor's office. So this is the shift of paradigm that we want to see in, in, in World Cities Culture Forum. We're 40 cities allied and we're building the arguments, we're making the case for culture, we're growing civic leaders, we're championing practical solutions. But it looks like Chicago, you're already doing it. So it's great, it's fantastic. Um, I'm now gonna give you some examples of policies. Next slide, please. A couple of policies, Creative Enterprise Zones and the Creative Land Trust. Um, and for example, this, uh, the Creative Land Trust has been inspired by a policy in San Francisco. Uh, it's based on the caste model. And likewise, Creative en Enterprise Zones are now being piloted in Toronto. So it's part of this IP free zone that I, I mentioned earlier. What are we trying to solve with creative enterprise zones? Well, you've heard the story time over and over again. Artists move into rundown areas of the city and then they make the neighborhoods more attractive. And what happens next? The prices go up and then the artists have to move on. We've heard this predicament. 
before, and it happens in all cities across the world. Artists are victims of their own success. And of course, COVID has exacerbated the fragility of our sector, not just across artists and our uh, fragile workforce, but also small venues. So creative enterprise zones is about allowing creatives to put down roots in an area, to stay in an area. And it's based on three pillars. The first pillar is about affordable space. And this is about planning. So how can we leverage our planning policy to enable affordable space to be there in perpetuity? So uh, we've worked very uh, closely with our um, city planners and on those zones, in creative enterprise zones, the, the new legislation say that there will be no net loss of affordable workspace and that there has to be an increase of affordable workspace. And one of the tools that we used is the Creative Land Trust, which is a vehicle that allows us to buy and to purchase buildings and to retain the rents low. And as I mentioned before, it's based on San Francisco's CAST, uh, Community Arts Stabilization Trust. And guess what? Sydney is now setting one up and Amsterdam is looking to set one up because we know is a policy that works. Um, and in Paris, they're doing a similar policy where um, the city is purchasing independent shops in order to keep the high street vibrant and independent. So it's a worldwide trend. Um, in terms of community, what the creative oh. enterprise zones wants to do is to build alliances in an area. So it's about a coalition of the businesses, of the local authority, arts and community organizations, youth centers, universities, private sector, everyone coalescing around a creative enterprise zone. And it is about sort of ensuring that there's no displacement, that you know, the forces of gentrification often what happens, then there's a displacement of communities, but we don't want that to happen. So what we want is like the community working together. And what we saw during COVID was that it was a ready-made network, support network, and it was able to access um, um, government support because it was already a community that was organized. And the third pillar on creative enterprise zones are jobs and skills. We want to make sure that the jobs and the skills sort of stay in the area, that local young people access the jobs. So we've got a big sort of funding program um, to skill up um, young people and to train young people, particularly of people of color in the areas to access the jobs in, in, those, in those zones. It's again this, you know, we don't want displacement. We want the benefits um, to stay in the area. Next slide, please. Uh, creative enterprise zones a little bit into numbers. What the good thing about creative enterprise zones was that we were able to leverage more funding. So 11 million turned into another 30. Uh, and also I, I explained before a little bit is that during COVID, it was really easy for creative enterprise zones to pivot uh, their activities to support the small businesses and the artists very, very quickly. It was organized. And because they were a group of um, an association, if you want, of, um, of organizations, they were able to access government funding. And now, we have the creative enterprise zones are enshrined in the planning system. Um, and we've got measures that protect artists in the, plan, in the urban planning. Uh, we're expanding the zones from three to six. Uh, and our ambition is to create a creative enterprise zone in each borough. Next slide, please. I'll just talk very briefly about um, cultural infrastructure plan and the culture risk office. There are two policies that support each other. The first one uh, is about planning for culture. 
a city plans for transport, a city plans for uh, hospitals, for schools, but we don't plan for culture. We need to plan for culture. So this was born out of, you know, we need to have a mapping of what we have, our venues, and not just our places of presentation, like cinemas and theatres, but also our places of production, the making spaces, the rehearsal spaces, the recording studios, the maker place. So we mapped this in order to have the data and the evidence in order to work with, with, with our planning department. Because if you cannot measure it, how can you advocate for it? How can you protect it? So a big sort of data exercise to give visibility to the planning uh, pro process of what we have in the, in the city. And then the flip chart of this was to have this culture at risk office, which we call the bat phone. Basically is someone at the end of the, the line at city hall that is able to respond and address the queries of arts organizations. And this might be connected with licensing, connected a dispute with a landowner or a developer, it could be around tax. So often it's that different departments in city hall and for a small organization, it's difficult to know how to navigate the, the, the different departments. So culture at risk office is one person that knows how to and helps the arts organizations navigate and brokers those sort of um, those relationships and, and helps. And a lot of the times, for example, we it's a letter from the mayor to uh, a landowner saying, please, can you keep the rents down? Uh, for the, this is a, an important organization to the city. And that does the trick. And often we have to do more uh, lobbying. Um, and it's, of course, during COVID, that office, we had to multiply the effort. We had to recruit more people to help us because the phone was buzzing. Um, and we're very happy that New York has taken on this, um, this idea of culture at risk and Mayor uh, Eric Adams announced a culture at risk office a few months ago. Next slide, please. I'm just going to share with you the starkness of what we found out when we started mapping between 2006, um, 2006 sorry, and 2016. London had lost 58% of LGBTQ plus venues, 50% of nightclubs, 40% of music venues, 30%, 35% artist studios, 25% of pubs. That was dramatic. Um, Next slide, please. So in conclusion, I would say jump to action, get the evidence, get the killer stats, add the jeopardy. What's at stake is a better city and also the city's international reputation. You know, we talked about one of your, your goals is about resilience. Build, building resilience is about organizing clusters um, and then identifying interventions that will make a difference. Our motto at uh, World Cities Culture Forum is about hardwiring hard wiring culture in the city. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Laia. Um, amazing content from our panelists. Thank you both. Um, we have just a few minutes for questions, also huge thanks to our colleagues at MPC and Amanda for addressing so many audience questions already in the Q&A. So keep those questions coming. Um, again, if we don't have time to get to them today, given our limited bandwidth here, we will we will respond with um, to answers to to all of them. Uh, but I did want to talk to to address to both of you, and maybe first to Laya and then to Aaron. Um, you know. We've talked a lot about the the opportunities in planning and kind of what you've been able to accomplish and the the you know the exciting pieces of this. But what are the what are some of the pitfalls that we need to think about within planning processes, um, either from other global cities, from your own experience? Um, what have we learned? Where can kind of planning go awry, and and how do we um, try and mitigate some of those challenges? Shall I start? 
Yeah, I mean, probably Erin will know more than me about this being a planner coming from a planning perspective. But, you know, planners, when you talk about protection, protection is usually seen as, you know, um, against development. It's so it's always planners will look to find a balance between, you know, you've got, you want, you want the city to grow. And of course, cities have housing targets that they need to meet. So it's how we hardwire ourselves into those policies that enable the city to grow and to develop at the same time respecting what's in there, the fabric, what makes the city the city. Uh, in my experience, what I found working with, with our planner, planners is that we had to make the we had to make visible the invisible. So, for example, you know, they understood why we have to protect theatres, because in London, the West End is theatres are protected by law. There's a law in the 1970s that protected those theatres. And that's why we have a theatre land. That's why we have a Western theatre. But of course, theatres are gorgeous buildings with architraves and, you know, and, and, and grand entrances. And part of the job with art planners was to say, we've got to protect music venues in the same way. We've got to protect uh, nightclubs in the same way. They're not, you know, they're, they're because they haven't got the sort of the architectural um, benefits or the exterior features, it doesn't mean that they're not important to us. And a lot was to explain why a city needs, needs grassroots venues. Why? Because they're the talent pipeline. Because, you know, Adele and Ed Sheeran and Stormzy didn't start in a, a big auditorium or in a TV show. So people, oh, no, no, people start, our artists hone their skills, build their audiences, starting in small venues. And, and that's what we, we need that for the pipeline. Uh, and likewise for galleries and likewise for, for many other art forms. So explaining that to our planners, you know, and, and explaining the, the role that small music venues and small LGBTQ plus venues had in the city was important. And then having the evidence, having the data. So that's why we did a lot of um, a lot of research around what was the loss, what were the reasons of the loss. I think the other thing that we did was to encourage our sector because we are so small organizations and micro businesses to organize themselves. The worst thing a politician needs is a room full of like small, small organizations not agreeing with each other. So for us, it's, it's better if we have an association of music venues, for example, that we can talk to and then that 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 we can dialogue with and then we can agree so that an action plan so we did a lot of encouraging um, of associations and um, in order to work together to find solutions thank you and I, we do have a, a incredible association um, community here in chicago that that uh, our city works with closely um aaron you want to touch base on, the, on some of the challenges of planning? Um, well, I think, you know, there, there are a couple. Of, one is planning is a really resource, resource intensive exercise, both in terms of, you know, uh, time on both, you know, the kind of resident engagement end and also on the kind of city, city resource end. And so these efforts require a lot and they require a lot from residents, right? To show up and to, to participate in these processes. Um, a lot of times, um, you know, planning process, we go through planning processes and there's no, um, I think, you know, real plan for the implementation and the sustainability and the evaluation of these um, exercises. And so, you know, once the planning process is done, right? These things, you know, get shelved and, you know, people move on to other things, you know, and then that ends up in kind of a, a, a vicious cycle where we're continuing to go back and ask the same questions um, from community. And I think that, you know, breeds a little bit of a, you know, kind of planning fatigue. And I know that, you know, residents are certainly 
um, you know, very, you know, engaged, always engaged, and we're so grateful for their time, but I know can be fatigued by, you know, feeling like they've been asked, asked these questions several times, right? So I think that the, the, the real, you know, thing that we need to overcome here is a sense of accountability to what we've said we've been, we're going to do, right? And an accountability that ensures that there are resources to implement, you know, the recommendations and also a sense of accountability in terms of these rec recommendations will be evaluated, right? Um, so that we can track progress for the public. So I think just the, the big trap, right? Is just making sure that this, um, that all of this effort is not for naught, right? And that um, there's still some real accountability to, to making sure that this, these things happen. And then I think we just have time for one more question. I wanna address sort of a couple of questions in the in the Q and A around um, questions and considerations of equity um, and equity when it comes to funding um, and how in a government context, which is always complicated, one can consider um, equitable outcomes. and And would love for each of you to reflect on how you think about that in your work and and how that um, how that's possible and centered within a government context. I can, I can start. Um, I think, you know, I think I touched on it a little bit when we were talking about our kind of grant making program. Um, and then the benefit is that we actually do uh, track a lot of data uh, with our grants program, which made a kind of assessment of it pretty easy, right? So we were able to, you know, track, uh, we worked with actually Bloom Bloomberg Associates uh, to do like a kind of deep dive analysis on our grant program in terms of who we were serving and who we weren't, right? Um, and what was, you know, illuminating because the data backed it up, it was not, not big news. I mean, we kind of knew this, right, anecdotally that we were uh, not, right, uh, grant program was not serviced in um, the South and the West sides of the city. And, and I think also I would say the Northwest side of the city um, or the far, far South side too, right, as much as we could. Um, and that there theoretically were organizations that should have been eligible to apply to our grant making program, but um, were not for whatever reason applying, right? So we, we knew that there were organizations there, but they were not applying. So uh, at least knowing that we were able to kind of develop some tools and some outreach tools to really focus on those organizations. Most of those organizations are small organizations, so organizations with budgets under uh, 250,000 under a hundred thousand dollars that are, you know, small, right. That, that brings itself to a small organization that may be, uh, one or one and a half staff and principally made up of the work of volunteers. Right. So we need to do a lot of work in terms of, um, restructuring those eligibility guidelines and criteria so that those grant programs are open and accessible to the way that those, uh, you know, businesses are structured. So we've been, you know, doing some work there. Um, the primary way that though that we reach, I think, communities of color is not by, you know, as you know, as kind of a racial framework, but by a geography framework, right, in terms of focusing um, on specific communities, specific communities that we've identified, you know, through a collaborative initiatives like Invest Southwest that I mentioned. So uh, communities that have been identified as priority for economic and community development. Um, com communities that are designated low to moderate income um, based on um, kind of the federal guidelines is also right um, where we um, make some uh, priority uh, grant making. Um, so again, we're looking at kind of um, place based condition right of particular communities um, and other indicators right of, of, of communities that are uh, lacking in resources like, you know, public safety indicators and public health indicators and all of those things, right? Because we know that those communities, um, when they're um, at, um, displaying other, right, um, things that indicate a lack of resource that those are uh, communities that we can focus on and that our dollars will um, uh, have some, some impact. So that's how we do it. I'll get to you. Very, yeah, it's very, we have very similar sort of approach which is what you say we've got to adapt you know we've got to adapt our tools of how we distribute the money um, and how we reach out and we reach through those communities that either they 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 are under underrepresented or 
they don't feel like they've got access to, to those pots of money. We've done um, similar initiatives. There was uh, an initiative called Culture Seeds, and this was sort of small grants. And we did roadshows. We went out there. We explained we, we, that we had uh, people supporting um, small community organizations, as you say, a lot with run by volunteers, how to make the application. I think we did one round where you could just do a video application. It wasn't paper. It was send us a video. Um, and it really reached out organizations that had never never had money from city hall so and i think it was like the majority was from underrepresented communities what we found as well is that a little bit of money from city hall were the the arts organizations and community organizations were able able to leverage uh other funding so actually our investment our our investment was able to be multiplied I think it was like tenfold or something like this is quite dramatic because having city hall um, funding brought status and therefore that organization was able to unlock other funding so I think the multiplying effect was incredible uh, and just recently we've launched uh, a new grant scheme called Untold Stories. And this is from the uh, Commission for Diversity in the Public Realm. And we're asking community-led organizations to come and bid and, and try to tell the, the untold stories uh, on the public realm and try to diversify, to try, try to make a city look like what the city, what the city look really looks like um, um so but yes i think what you say is like is 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 a mix of adapting the the ways of distributing the money uh and at the same time you know being having that more agile agile more agile way of uh, engaging with with community groups so much more to say, but I'm going to reluctantly turn it back over to Christina and thank our panelists so much for their time um, and, and your incredible work in your respective cities. Thank you so much. Go Chicago. <laughs> yes, thank you um, to all our speakers, panelists and moderator for today's conversation. We hope that through the presentations, you've all gained a better understanding of the goals of the We Will Chicago citywide plan and what it can accomplish. Uh, the next part of our pro program will include some polling where you can provide feedback on the plan's draft objectives and goals. So for the remainder of our time together, we would like to engage in an activity using the tool Menti to see what you think about the draft goals and objectives that were discussed today. Um, we're gonna focus on two. Uh, all the feedback that is captured being the polling will be provided back to the city of Chicago to help inform changes to the draft framework. We will be remaining in this webinar format for this activity, but if you have any questions, please continue to use the Q&A box and we will send out answers after the event. You can also send an email to wewillchicago, wewill at cityofchicago.org. Again, that's wewill at cityofchicago.org. Because we are using the Menti online, online today, this will not be a conversational session. For those interested in having conversations about these goals or sharing their broader thoughts, we urge you to join for the upcoming in-person events that were presented at the beginning of this meeting that are happening across the city all throughout the summer. Check out that event schedule at www.wewillchicago.com and we can also drop that into the chat. So um, please go to www.menti.com and enter the code 12501566 to get started and click the little um, thumbs up thing to let us know that you are in and we will start after we feel like we have a critical mass, critical mass.
All right, I see more people joining. We're at 27. We're at 35, it seems to be pretty steady. I'm going once, going twice. Oh, 39. All right, we're gonna get started. Um, so first, first question, on a scale of one to five, please select the extent to which you agree with goal number one. And so goal number one is support the resiliency of the creative sector, its workers, organizations, and businesses for a healthy and vibrant city. And so the scale is from strongly disagree to strongly agree, one to five, with one being um, strongly disagree, five being strongly agree. Support the resiliency of the creative sector, its workers, organizations, and businesses for a healthy and vibrant city. Here holding pretty steady, steady at a 4.7, it looks like right now. I think we're waiting on just a few more people to weigh in. We're at 36. We're at 39. I think that was where we were at. Okay, on a scale, and you'll have a chance to provide a little bit more feedback that's not um, quantitative coming up uh, after this slide for this goal. So on a scale of one to five, please select the extent to which you agree with or support each of the following objectives, which are part of goal number one. So there are four goals, I mean, four objectives that are part of goal number one. You're asking you to provide Similar to the first one, a strongly disagree to strongly agree level of agreement from a scale of one to five for each one of the objectives. The objectives are as follows. Strengthen the infrastructure and systems of support needed for creative sector organizations, businesses, and individuals to thrive. Decrease barriers that prevent access to city funding for creatives and creative organizations. Prioritize racial, gender, disability, geographic equity. Three, ensure that employment policies for creative workers used by public and private entities are fair and equitable. And four, support the relationships necessary for creatives to develop skills, pursue opportunities, access jobs, and connect within the field. Again, it's on a scale of one to five, one being strongly disagree uh, or support, five being strongly agree or support. Seems like there's generally high levels of support or and or agreement for each one of these. Um, for the next activity, after we get everyone to weigh in, we will see what people think um, are some things that are missing or things that they like. All right, we were at 40, so we're gonna move to the next question. We are going through this pretty quickly just to be um, cognizant of time. And these next two slides are gonna take a little bit longer. So what do you like about this goal and objectives? And so these are sentence responses to um, let us know what you like about this goal and objectives. Don't worry, this won't remain strictly about like, we're gonna, in the next slide, we will ask what might be missing to, to get additional feedback and ideas. Resiliency is everything while the COVID situation remains uncertain. Great thought. 
it just says equity and resilience. I see a couple on here that are about equity um, and resilience, breaking down barriers and hoops to jump through funding. I'm not, uh, I'm just picking some to read out, not necessarily saying we agree or disagree, just um, naming a couple that are, com that are coming up as we scroll, scroll through. So that includes both organizations and artists. I think I saw that a couple um, in some of the other boxes above as well. Execution is critical. Need for additional supportive infrastructure. Another about resilience. Arts and creatives being the backbone. Independent venues. Yes. All right, I think we just want to give this a few more, probably a minute or so. We're at 31. I think about 40 people had replied to the previous two. I understand some people might not want to share directly on this, so we'll just give it another minute and then we'll move to the next um, goal. Make sure this goes. All right, we are going to move to the next one. So, what is missing from this about this goal and its objective? What would you change? So someone has started us off with how success being measured. Someone saying no changes. Emphasis on including some small media. Collaboration with even more city departments and offices. Concerns about pred predatory and monopolistic practices of huge corporate entities. Some ambiguity still exists. more explicit language around um, BIPOC and LBGTQ+. Focus on youth, outreach to vulnerable populations. The goal is very broad. Specificity might be helpful. Hopefully some specificity will be um, included in the policies that I think Amanda earlier noted will be coming out as part of this framework. Someone else is noting that some of it is vague. All right, so we are gonna stay here for about another minute. And then just because uh, we wanna be conscious of time, um, we will be moving on to the next goal.
participants of all ages, arts education, arts recreation, discussion of scale, programming, nothing. Okay, let's move to the next one. All right, on a scale of one to five, please select the extent to which you agree with goal number two. Um, so we're doing two goals, so this is the second one. Uh, this is, of course, on a scale one to five, strongly disagree to strongly agree. Engage artists, creative businesses, and cultural organizations to advance the quality of life in all Chicago communities. All right, just uh, I think we're waiting for a few more folks and we'll move on to the next one. Seems like we're holding pretty steady at 4.7, 31, oh, 32. Might be our new number. All right, on a scale of one to five, please select the extent to which you agree with or support each of the following objectives or a part of goal number two. So there are three for goal number two. Um, the first one is use the power of arts and culture to build vibrant, healthy communities. Two is increase the number of creative businesses and cultural spaces and community areas that lack them. And then three, prioritize private and public investment in historically under-resourced community areas. Scale of one to five, strongly disagree, strongly agree. You seem to be a little bit closer to the four than some of the other ones have been. So it'd be interesting to see um, what people like and what people think are missing um, in the next two slides. All right, we are gonna give this, I think we're trying to get to 31 or 32. I think there's maybe one more coming in. All right, we're gonna to move to the next slide. So what do you like about this goal and its objectives? Um, same question as last time, different, different goal and different objectives. Um, it was the goal we just did, so it was goal number two. Let me pull it up and I can read it again for you all as well. So goal two is... Uh, Morgan, I think you have it up. You can put it down. Goal two is engage artists, creative businesses, and cultural organizations to advance the quality of life in all Chicago communities. Um, objective one is use the power of arts and culture to build vibrant, healthy communities. Objective 2.2, increase the number of creative businesses and cultural spaces in community areas that lack them. And goal 2.3, objective 2.3, prioritize private and public investment in historically under-resourced community areas. All right, we have about one minute to wrap up. So I'd like folks to start on the last question, which we have around what is missing. Um, what are some changes they might wanna make? So what is missing from this goal and its objective? What would you change? Again, I'll read out the goals and objectives. Um, goal two, engage artists, creative businesses, and cultural organizations to advance the quality of life in all Chicago communities. Objective one, um, use the power of arts and culture to build vibrant, healthy communities. 
objective two, increase the number of creative businesses and cultural spaces and community areas that lack them. And then objective three, prioritize private and public investment in historically under-resourced community areas. So what is missing from this goal and its objective and what would you change? And um, as people fill in their responses, we are at 1.30. So I'd like to thank, we're gonna keep this up and keep going, but if you have to leave, we totally understand. Hey, um, time is a precious resource. So we thank you for joining us today and we will be following up after the event with um, the question and answers from the Q&A box, um, as well as some materials as well. Oh, some of the answers, private investment always equals gentrification, um, metrics, funding. It just has themes and goals without targets. I think that's related to the metrics part again, specific commitments, um, distinguish between grassroots artists, art orgs that need more support. They are very general. Specific language that prior prioritizes the public piece of this. Assets that exist are being supported. Artists need and support and vision needs to be a first concern. Outreach needs to be included. Next steps and clear guidelines. Reciprocity of communities of support artists. Culture is not the only solution to address these listed objectives. All right, it looks like we might be holding steady here at 19 responses. Oh, spoke too soon, 20. Partnerships with established well managed organizations. Backing up historical properties. All right, I think we're about at the number we were at for some of the other exercises. So we are going to stop the polling, um, but this isn't your only opportunity to participate. As I mentioned, go to um, wewillchicago.com and click on calendar of events and you can find other ways to join in um, and provide feedback and input on these goals and objectives and the overall citywide plan. With that, thank you all for coming. Hope to see you at another We Will Chicago event.